Hello and welcome to this episode of Bloodhound Picks. As always, I am one of your hosts, Craig. And I'm Josh. <laughs> okay, and this episode is going back to kind of our main subject of a double feature, which is my pick. And I picked two films. Originally, there was going to be a different theme, but one of the movies is hard to find in the United States. And so had to kind of go back and forth on some, but I think the theme connects enough. We deal with kind of the element of a loop or spiral. We'll probably have already given it away. Um, one of them is an adaptation from a manga. The other one has a comic book adaptation on about the movie, I guess is the way to say it. And then... Yeah, I'll just give what they are. It is 2004's Uzumaki, based on Juji Ito's Uzumaki, which means spiral. And then um, Thomas Jane's Dark Country from, I believe it was 08, right? Or 09, yes, 09. And so, funny story, when Josh and I first met, he is a big Thomas Jane fan. But he only watched Hung and Punisher. Uh, and he was like, well, I'm a big horror fan too. And I haven't, and so I think Thomas Jane should do all these horror films. And I said, what? You haven't seen? And I listed off all of them. And I told him about Dark Country and introduced him to all of that. And that is 100% of how that story went. Yeah, I, I definitely remember it happening just yes. like that. Um, so no, I wanted to actually do these because I think it plays in a different way too. Where So I'm a big, as we've talked about on this podcast, Junji Ito fan. This is our first time watching Uzumaki, all three of us, the, the movie itself. But I kind of held off for a very long time because there's so many people that have said, well, if you're a fan of the book, the movie doesn't like work up to it or don't even bother with it but so i've read the book several times throughout the years um kyle had just read the book right before he watched the movie and josh hasn't read the book but watched the movie so i'm interested to see kind of the differences and then same with dark Tr country josh it is one of his favorite films thanks to me um <laughs> and he's read the comic book i've watched the movie twice yes twice um and then i just bought the comic book it came in today right before we started recording so i was able to read it and then kyle is, watched it for the first time and so we have three kind of different opinions but let's start with uzumaki which is again from 04, or well, 2000, but it came to the United States, I believe, in 04. Um, so, a lot of Junji Ito's work in describing it, it doesn't sound like it's creepy at all. It doesn't sound like it can be scary. Um, my, it's not necessarily my favorite of his, but it's considered his masterpiece, my favorite to even describe it and say, oh, well, there's this story about these fish on mechanical legs going around and they bring a death stench. It sounds stupid. I completely understand, but it is surprisingly well effective. And that was the, the second one we were going to try and do. But because they animated it, the Tokyo fish attack is what it's called. But yeah, you just can't really find it here. So with Uzumaki or Spiral, as it's known here, is a. I will just read the IMDb, and it's the inhabitants of a small Japanese town become increasingly obsessed and with and tormented by spirits. So, huh? That is. Or, That's by, not true at all. Yeah. Or by sorry, the, I guess it was a miss thing. Let me. I went to a different one. By spirals. That is the. Um, so describing that, it, 
it's <clears throat> it's a hard one to talk about but really the manga to not get into too much spoilers about half of it or so it plays very episodically where it's um kiri who is describing basically the what's happening to the town it'll be like oh this happened to this character or these students or whatever and it's each one is spiral related but it's kind of a series of different things that are loosely connected because they're all in the same town but not really and then the other half of the manga kind of loses some steam in my opinion um kyle can bring in his too because he just read it but then it tries to connect everything in a way and it tries to kind of tell this tell a story finally which but the movie even though it's so episodic the movie tries to make a feature out of this while also keeping it episodic but yeah before we get into it more um the only other thing i'll say is that there are differences because the manga hadn't been finished during that time either so like the ending is different than the ending of the book and stuff like that but so josh actually, yeah that's a great point um josh since you didn't read the book how did you because you sent a message to me after, while watching it that you really liked Uzumaki. Or at least that you could talk a lot about it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what you loved about it and, and to hear. I mean, I guess the simplest answer is that uh, it doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> and um, it doesn't really make any sense. And it was really like, like just weird um, and like kind of an a way that only you know japanese can do because <laughs> um i mean you know it, honestly it's taking a spiral which is let's be honest the most boring <laughs> artwork ever created and they're like all these characters are talking about how awesome it is and this that and the other thing and it's just like what no <laughs> um and you know, obviously everybody is becoming, I don't even know what they're becoming. They're becoming like infected in some way. I, I mean, uh, and it doesn't, and it, none of it makes sense either, which, you know, is going to, I think is you're either going to really like it or you're not. And I didn't have any problem with it. I guess maybe because I sort of knew that it was going to be really fucking weird. Um, I didn't know that it wasn't going to make sense, but <laughs> that didn't, again, that didn't really bother me. Um, Cause I mean, let's be honest, you get into what, like half hour into the thing. And if you don't kind of know what you're going to be in store for, you know, by that point. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was good. It was definitely yeah. never boring. And um yeah, it just wasn't that satisfying either, I suppose. Um, the main character was also one of the more annoying things about the movie. Um, and I think it honestly, it was just due to the fact that like, you know, her boyfriend uh, is basically at minute 15 telling her that they should leave this fucking place because there's this weird shit going on. And she just refuses to listen to anybody, even though she's witnessing weird shit going on and people dying. And it's just like, it literally takes the entire movie for her to acknowledge that, yeah, these people are probably right. You should probably leave. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of annoying. But I guess, you know, um, that, I, yeah. I guess what I will say is, is the character seemed like it was just one cliche after another mm -hmm. you know she's like this she's like this school girl type character almost i mean that's probably not accurate but in a lot of ways um and she's not very smart um so i don't know i mean honestly that was the most annoying thing Th that was the thing that that i didn't like the most was that character mm -hmm. because it was it was just like jesus christ 
how many more things have to happen for you to get it through your fucking head that yeah dude there's some weird shit going on so i mean i guess if that's the worst thing for me to complain about really wasn't that bad no it so it's interesting because so much of the movie to me um it feel like they're trying to keep the episodic nature but it almost feels like a greatest hits album of the book where it's like you know it has um there's a hair sequence in it that it plays out bigger in the in the book obviously um there's a snail people sequence again but they bring in all these little sequences that um have a whole um section to themselves in the manga and then they're like oh we just gotta throw it all in and yeah by the time you reach reach the end like oh but we're also trying to make a feature out of this (laughs) and tell a narrative feature or something but no i i really like i think both of these movies that we're talking about today have a um lynchian kind of influence too or at least can be considered in that sense yeah the news the news crew actually plays a huge part which in the in the movie they kind of just pop up and they're just yeah and then the the, there's like the other journalist who i can't remember i feel like he's not in the book yeah to try and make sense of it where the book itself there's really no ever an explanation to the spiral where this they there's like that quick flash of like serpent cult or whatever is flashing on the screen or stuff like that yeah because there's that one where you see the car driving and you're watching out the front window and that slowly like fades into the two of them talk yeah and no there i think there's some great shots in that sense and it really does make you like I was looking in every shot to see if I could find a spiral because there's moments where they digitally kind of move the the dirt to make a spiral. The camera even sh- like moves in a spiral formation at times. Or so I mean, you're really you're looking for it, which I give. And I think there's like what you were saying, Josh. There's some weird moments too, where there's you'll just see people standing around and they're just walking by them, like nothing, and but standing around in a very kind of creepy way and. Yeah, everything and it's just very off in the movie. But no, I think it, yeah. It did kind of become one of those games of at least for me, after I started noticing that there were literally spirals almost in every <laughs> frame of the movie, I was just like it became a game of let's see how long it takes me to find whatever the spiral <laughs> in this frame because they were literally fucking everywhere. Yeah. And um I it, it'd be interesting to get a number of how many times there was one just you know not the ones where it was like cgi because that happened obviously that was a lot more noticeable but i mean there were i can't even remember like specific parts but but they they were in a lot of the shots like you know almost hidden to where it's like let's play this game of where can i spot the spiral (laughs) if so for those of you listening if you want to give us money on our patreon we will go through uzumaki and find every spiral again <laughs> yeah. um no, i so yeah i think i'd i'd go with josh of that if i didn't read the book i think i'd probably like it a lot better i want to say and i liked it the way it is now and i think like it works well but yes um it really does become knowing what happens in the book and knowing how it goes about you kind of wish well just stick with then if you're going to do it that way one of the stories like just stick with the father or some i don't know or something to just kind of condense it or i don't know it would have to be a mini series type of if you're going based kind of more traditionally off of the manga itself no because by i think it was the movie is about 90 minutes i think maybe a couple minutes yeah and by i think it was an hour and 15 i was looking at the time going wait nothing's really happened so when is this plot gonna like what's gonna when's this resolution gonna pick up and it like very quickly at the end it like there's some sort of resolution which um the 
Yeah, but the ending in this one, I actually prefer. I know, Kyle, you said the same thing to the ending of the book, but it does just come out of nowhere that it doesn't seem earned, I guess. <laughs> because in the book, um, Shuichi, the boyfriend, he goes create his parents suffer a fate to not give too much spoiler. He kind of goes crazy and then he just disappears for a long chunk of the book. And then he pops up occasion he pops up randomly throughout until the end. Um yeah, and yeah, a lot some characters were kind of merged together into one, um, to you know, obviously fit the um feature length and stuff like that, but I don't know. I'd I can't wait for the adult swim version. When it, it was supposed to come out, I thought last year, but and that's kind of Junji Ito's work in itself, I think. Like it's so and there's a lot of manga like that where there are a lot of elements that you would almost need cgi to help enhance it that you couldn't accomplish with practical effects in a cheap enough way but then to do it in cheap cgi would also look kind of not great either so it you know but i know there's a lot of manga you know do you talk about akira anything where it doesn't cross over well to a live action format. Anything else on Uzumaki? Well, I, uh, one of you, I can't remember which one of you was talking about. I think it was you, Craig, that like nothing really happens. <laughs> um, but I will say that the, the plot, if that's what you want to call it in this movie, <laughs> it's right it's very it's very repetitive yeah. like a fucking spiral yeah. like same shit happens over and over and over and over obviously it's different like for instance you mentioned the the kid that uh that is in love with the main character how many yeah. how many times did he like jump out and scare her to the point where it was just like punch that kid in the face <laughs> first of all but you know that's just one example of something yeah. happening repeatedly and it's it's there's obviously more than just yeah. that instance um i don't know if that was intentional or not but i guess it if it if it wasn't uh they did a good job of of making it kind of noticeable anyway yeah in their, in their spiral movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> so <laughs> that is Uzumaki, also known as Spiral. If I don't even know how to find it, to have if you want to watch it in the states, because there are a DVD, there are physical copies, but it's like forty dollars for a, I think, is what I found on eBay or stuff like that. So it's a pretty difficult find. Um, hopefully, when the Adult Swim version comes out, they actually do a re-release or something because. I mean, I don't know. Maybe in earning my or trying to get my Junji Ito collection, I want to try and get the movies too. But yeah, alas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so next up, we have Dark Country from 2009, which is directed by Thomas Jane, written by Tad Murphy. And also stars Thomas Jane, Ron Perlman, Lauren German. And here, let me see. The IMDb of synopsis of this says, A couple en route from Las Vegas are forced to deal with a body out in the desert, making their honeymoon one hellish ride. <laughs> so, that is the IMDb synopsis. Um... So basically the movie in itself is, again, we kind of talked about the Lynchian element. There will be some spoilers, so I don't want to give too much away. But it, there's also a lot of comic book influence, even though it wasn't adapted from a comic book. The way it's shot is very stylized. And it's kind of they get lost in the desert and it becomes kind of a, a loop-like scenario. I'm trying to say this without spoiling too much but that becomes apparent pretty early on that they just can't escape this desert they hit somebody with their car 
he becomes aggressive they kill him they bury the body but then all these other strange things start happening and yeah that is pretty much it 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 feels very twilight zone-esque in a way but since josh it's one of his favorite movies i will let him go first and kind of really talk about it because yeah he loves the movie he's even talked on q a's with thomas jane about it he got i think signed copy of stuff from it and take away josh all right yeah so um i talked to thomas jane a little bit about dark country because it is one of my favorite films of all time um i don't really care that there's some issues with it um but uh he yeah so we talked about how they did a comic adaptation of it um which you know there's no dialogue in the comic um but it's sort of interesting that it is very the direction of the movie is pretty amazing i think anyway i mean if just the the style of the directing fits the film so well um and it is very comic bookish it's, on, it's like almost like sin city yeah. type i mean it's obviously not that you know drastic but um so yeah he sent me he sent me the book um uh, and he also sent me his personal director's cut of the film um very nice man um i personally don't like the director's cut as much um because it's shorter <laughs> um normally normally that would be uh an instant turn on for me but um essentially in the director's cut of the movie at the very beginning uh thomas jane lauren german are at a motel uh before they kind of set out on their journey and in the scene uh in the theatrical cut there's a bit where thomas jane's character goes into this whole story about uh basically you know uh his love life sort of um and it takes up a significant amount of time i mean that whole thing is cut in the director's cut so essentially it hits the ground running um and there's literally nothing there's no fat i think the director's cut was like maybe 78 minutes or something and i think the other one was like 80 something or other yeah um but yeah um there's 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 definitely some some problems with the logic of this movie um i don't really give a shit about those <laughs> um but let, let's be honest uh a lot of times when you're dealing with plots of this sort um you almost are gonna invariably have some kind of logic issue um just because time travel plots etc you know you got a lot to kind of keep straight in your mind and and be you know uh get across to the viewer and not be you know missing stuff or whatever it may be but um so in also speaking of the comic um influences uh the character of the um the guy they hit with the car um is played by thomas jane also but um the design of the character because he's basically like completely fucked up to the point where you can't tell what his face looks like uh that was designed by bernie wrightson uh the late bernie wrightson um and then also um tom jane's uh partner from uh his comic studio raw studios uh tim bradstreet um also uh did some design where i can't remember specifically what it was but um very heavily comic influenced yeah. in in numerous ways so um yeah I, I think if if you could uh if you could 
if I could label like a film that is like 100% my sensibility, this would be it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I could, I could go on for, for a while about this movie. <laughs> you could go on longer if you want. I mean, well, it, I, yeah. it is, um, I haven't said anything yet. So, okay. Yeah. It is very much noir in its style and yeah comic book style and uh, yeah yeah um, i i i almost think that um they should have i mean i know it was tab murphy's the the writers craig mentioned i almost feel like they should have incorporated lauren german into you know just to give it a little bit more so it wasn't yeah. just so focused on thomas jane but i mean yeah that's either neither here nor there. Um, and speaking of the 3D, um, yeah, this is, uh, I've seen this film hundreds of times. Um, and I i almost bought the 3D version of the Blu-ray because I'm such a dork. I don't have a, I don't have a 3D. I don't have any way to actually see it in 3D though. Um, but the only way uh, the Blu-ray that it doesn't exist on Blu-ray other than that. And it's a French Blu-ray too. So it's not even United States region, you know? Um, but I almost bought it anyway, just to say I fucking have it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can totally tell where everything is supposed to be 3d. And I think it would make it, I think it would make the movie better because those shots got, would, would just look amazing. At least to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, even a lot of the places, the rest stops they stop at are all made to look like very old. And I don't know. So, it, yeah. But it it is one of those strange ones, logic-based too, because it has that time travel element. But also, um, there's I think that purgatory type element to it. I don't know. There's, yeah. Like trying to decide what one to do. Yeah. I mean, because the only information you really get is that they kind of, the couple met fairly recently before they got married. Yeah. It was like literally the night yeah. before. Yeah. And then that's about it without, you know, obviously spoiling anything for anybody that hasn't watched it. You definitely should. But um then there's some secrets about him that are kind of hinted at, but never necessarily reveal. I don't know. Yeah, but I would agree with Kyle. There's never anything that would dictate why they would be in a purgatory or what they would have done besides, you know, just a couple that got married, you know, after a night of drinking or whatever in Las Vegas and decided to drive through the desert. I, I think it's just supposed to be... Um one of those things where it's like, well, it's happened to him because he just happened to be, you know, yeah. it's just completely circumstantial. Um, but yeah, I think normally, uh, or it would seem anyway that in, in, in plots, in films, TV, whatever, where you have characters that are in a purgatory, there's, they're obviously most of the time, there because they're a shitty person yeah or you know or some variation yeah. of that um yeah but i would agree with you josh that i kind of wish that lauren german was involved more and then even what you were saying kyle of having ron perlman pop up more or even be more of a sinister present i don't know or something to just bring both of those characters to the forefront more because so much of it is just kind of Thomas Jane wandering around <laughs> through the desert for parts of it, you know. Ron Perlman seems to do that with a lot of filmmakers. They just kind of <laughs> will show up for them to like throw himself in for because he did that for um one movie we might do at some point, I Sell the Dead. Or I think he was he worked with Bless I Picks before and he was so he kind of showed up for a day or two to do that. Um, yeah other movies as well <laughs> but josh this is your moment to shine do you have any more to talk um, about for dark country i don't know um 
I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, you could, you could go on about, you know, getting into, um, sort of the things that don't make sense, even though it's clearly not trying to not make sense. Sorry, that sounded stupid, but, um, you know, there, and the logic issues, uh, that appear, basically they come like one right after the other, yeah. um, at about minute 75, 70, yeah. something like that. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I it's probably not worth getting into, I mean, it's certainly not to me cause it doesn't bother me. Um, I get what the fucking intention was. So, you know, um, yeah, it's interesting too. in speaking in the, in terms of the plot, you know, you go, you got Thomas Jane and Laura, Lauren German in a car driving for what? 75% of the plot. Yeah. And then at the moment that they split up, which Kyle mentioned, um, and Ron Perlman just comes into the film literally out of fucking nowhere. So they're driving, they're driving, <laughs> you know, on this road, on this highway in the desert between Nevada and California or Arizona, yeah. whatever. And there's literally not a single car ever, right? <laughs> it's creepy as hell. But then Ron Perlman, have, he's a cop and he just shows up out of nowhere. Yeah. And uh, and then it goes from like that moment, then there's a whole bunch more characters that come into the movie yeah. um, in the form of, you know, however many police officers, um, which is an interesting kind of what, I mean, I'm glad they did it cause it kind of changed shit up like yeah. considerably. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a great movie. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you're a fan of, if you're a fan of the twilight zone for damn sure, um, you, you, you're going to love this. If you haven't seen it, we're talking about a film that's what 11 years old now, but yeah, I know a lot of people, I don't think they have. And, but even because he, did he also direct give them hell Maloney or did he just kind of produce it and via? Yeah. Okay. That was like a starring vehicle. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's Russell Molokai okay. was the director. Okay. But I know, but apparently speaking to that apparently that's they're making a sequel to that yeah i still haven't seen that one i plan on it and then with his new production oh, fuck yeah, that, that one's great yeah <laughs> i'm glad i introduced you to that one too <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> um but no i i know that he has renegade renegade entertainment now because raw studios from what i looked up is kind of non-existent even though the website's there and still working it's kind of all transitioned over to um that other one and renegade entertainment but yeah they're talking about the give them hell maloney sequel and i think i don't know he seems to really love the comic book approach and uh, just being stylistic and stuff like that but i know he's talked about directing again but and there's some comic books i think still in the that he's been working on but yeah he has a lot of projects that he's been working on for a long time and yet we keep seeing them and you know breach or things like that which don't get to utilize his talent to the best of his ability and run yeah. i'd fight yeah no i mean he is you just wish you saw him more as like the you know main characters and stuff like that but yeah so i also um I also have one of the uh, original uh, posters for this film that don't, they don't exist now. Um, it's actually, I'm staring at it right now. Um, and I got, um, I got one of the um, cast and crew shirts, oh. um, which obviously those don't exist anymore either. So I don't wear it all that often because I'd want it to last forever yeah. and it's a shirt. So it's not going to last forever. You should, there's those, um, <laughs> there's those frame the, where you can put like the, the jerseys in or whatever, just put the shirt. In oh yeah. With all the other, your, if you get the Blu-ray, all that stuff, put it in a big frame. 
Yeah, I still I, I I was still looking at getting that that Blu-ray um because I have an all region player. So the the French region I don't really give a shit about, but um it would be really nice to see that film in 3D though, just because yeah. I think it'll I think it would really change um I, I mean a lot because you know, like Kyle said, not every shot in the movie is in 3D. Yeah. But the ones that are, you know, you can obviously tell um, because, like you said, the, the, you know, the composite just looks really like off. So I would love to see it in 3D, though. Right. So maybe when this pandemic is under control, we can, if those of you interested again for hearing this episode, we can, the two of us, Kyle, can make a trip to Iowa. Josh, you can get that 3D copy, and we'll do an audio commentary on Dark Country. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have to get a 3D TV. A 3D TV. I, think, yeah. <laughs> I think you just need a, I think you just need a player. No, I think you need both from what I remember. It's, you need the 3D player and a 3D TV. <laughs> and then oh, the 3D fuck that. Yeah, because, I would agree with that. Because I was going to get, a, I almost got a 3D player because of um, my love of Dread, the 2012 one. And I heard the it in 3D looked so incredible, and then yeah, I looked at all the prices. I was like, uh, I'm I'm fine with it being in 2D. I guess. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> so I think that is our episode on Uzumaki and Dark Country. Of course, if you like Dark Country, if you liked Uzumaki, or if you hated them, send us your comments, rate us. Not me, no. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us all your thoughts. And yeah, of course, like, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff. And also, if you have any suggestions for kind of truly independent horror or dark genre movies as i guess they're called and um or obscure movies that we haven't covered yet please send them our way because obviously we've been doing this for some time now and we're <laughs> yeah we, we have seen, seen everything yeah yeah <laughs> so send us suggestions of obscure or truly independent film and yeah until next time thank you for listening bloodhound picks podcast is part of the morbidly beautiful podcast network Produced by Josh Lee, Craig Drum, and Kyle Hintz. Music by Raymond Seed. Editing by Kyle Hintz.